Welcome to The Dennis Report. I'm Dennis Acheson. A year ago, we interviewed Tom Swift, musician, songwriter, singer. Something about that show had some magic happen in it, and we wanted to bring it back again for you to watch. Tom catches the fact that everything's connected, a major theme of the show, as well as it's bigger than all of us. So for those two reasons, we hope you really enjoy this amazing conversation with Tom Swift. And if you like what you see, please support the show, clicking the Patreon link in the upper right corner. Here's Tom. As a troubadour, musician, singer, songwriter, and we're very pleased to have him here today. Yeah, it's great to be here. Thanks for taking time. It's 11 in the morning. It might be early for you, no? <laughs> uh, you know, for this it is, yeah. but uh, not too early. Great. My kids get me up early. Great. You know. <laughs> That'll do it. Yeah. While we were waiting and as we were prepping for the show, you told a great story about that bracelet that you've got on. Yeah. I, so it show, was a, show the camera. Was, yeah, yeah, well, this bracelet, can you see it? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here, this one. Use this this one. one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. I met a, I met a gentleman uh, on a flight to Memphis about three years ago. And uh, he was a blacksmith. And he had a beautiful bracelet on when we were talking. And he ended up you know, coming to all my shows, and and this just arrived in the mail for me last week. So I mean, this, this is a little gift that he, you know, he made this thing and sent it to me. So it's pretty sweet. It must have been a surprise when it, it arrived. It was a big surprise, yeah. yeah. So I def- oh. definitely sent him a CD. Yeah. And why were you down in Memphis? All this I was representing Atlanta, Canada at the um, International Blues Challenge. Yeah. Yeah. Can. Blues Challenge is like a competition of some sort? It was, kind of, it was a little wacky that way. Yeah. But there were uh, artists from all over the world there. Um, and uh, every state was represented. They have their own blues society. And um, you, you had a certain time frame to play, you know, like your set was so long and uh, you couldn't go over that time frame or, or they, you know. Uh, <laughs> gave you demerits or something. <laughs> Sounds antithetical. Man. Yeah, it was a little weird that way, but I mean, overall, it was just a celebration of the music yeah, genre. Yeah, exactly. And um, being in Memphis, you know, it has such a ri- rich historical. Yeah, it's got a vibe. Yeah, you know, with music. So. And, and you'd be in the mix with all of the others, so great gathering that way. Yeah, um, and I heard a lot of great stuff. Yeah. L- and you can share any stories in I, No, no, not going to do that. <laughs> I thought that was just Vegas. No, we, uh, my brother was there. Uh, Michael was with me, and uh, we just had a really great time. Yeah. And he, you know, I had been there a few times before. Michael had never been there, so it was pretty sweet. Went to Graceland, you know, did, did everything. Really? Yeah. Oh, wow. It was awesome. It's kind of fun to be a tourist. It is. I, like all the other times I've been down there, I just kind of was, you know, I was just doing my thing. Yeah. And I never really did much, but we, you know, we went to Sun Studios and, you know, that's where Johnny Cash and... What was that like? It was awesome. Amazing. Amazing. Is it a big, big studio, small no, studio? No, it's just a tiny little thing. Yeah. And all that great music came out, you know, back in the days where you could record a song and that afternoon it'd be a number one hit. Yeah. You know, so Elvis and Jerry Lee Lewis and, you know, all those, all those guys, you know, came out of that area. As you move it back to Atlanta, Canada, um, there's a lot going on in the music world in Atlanta, Canada. It's like, um, I don't know what, if I want to call it a rebirth, but something juicy has been happening a lot. So you, you know, from my perspective, it's always been That's it. It's not really a rebirth. It's your, always been there. Yeah, rumbling <clears throat> under your feet, so to speak. But something has shifted, though, the past 10, 15 years, whether it's the uh, ECMAs helping draw attention to it, whether it's the smaller studios starting to pop up. That's why I jumped to that, because mm-hmm. you talk about Sun Studios, and it was a certain scale, and mm-hmm. it had a certain vibe to it. Right. And it seems like it's not too much of a reach to say almost the same thing is happening in Atlantic Canada with those production studios popping up and Yeah, there's artists. a lot of them. Yeah. There's a lot of them. Uh, you know, me growing up in Macadam, then moving to Fredericton and spending a lot of time there. Mm-hmm. And uh, it was a natural thing for me to just kind of move to Halifax. It's a little bigger spot. Yeah. And it seems like a lot of artists just kind of uh, make their way there. Yeah. Maybe because there's a little bit more work, maybe it's a kind of a big city feel there. Yeah. For example, like I'm right now, I'm producing some music for Veterans Affairs. Really? You know, like that—that that is a gig that I just go to the studio and 
and uh, be creative and hire musicians to do this work. So, you know, there's more and more of that stuff going on. Nova Scotia film industry has taken a big hit just lately. Um, I don't, I don't understand the reasoning behind that at all. Is this government policy stuff? Yeah, I think it was just a move that McNeil made that um, he's not comfortable reneging on it or admitting that it was the wrong move, but it was the wrong move. Was that the kerfuffle about a year ago with um, changing some of the tax credits? Yeah. And, and it yeah, really it impacted the yeah, industry. And the industry created a lobby around it. Absolutely. And it was not a good thing. Oh, my. Yeah. Because so. Nova Scotia was kind of cons kind of considered a um, movie production East Absolutely. Coast compared Absolutely. to BC. You know, and a, lot of, a lot of people that I know that you know were grips or makeup artists or all those people, yeah. you know, there's no work. Yeah. So it's the and and it just went somewhere else, you know. It's just it's going to go yeah, somewhere else. Yeah, go find another place. Right. Which gets it's not tied to music, but it is tied to music business. So it, it's one of those narratives that needs some massaging at some point. Is at what point um, does government stop subsidizing things so that mm -hmm. they can run on their own? I'm right. mainly thinking a big industry here, but. Right. You know, movie business and music business maybe is related to it. Mm, I believe and, so, yeah. And, and at some point, when can it just run on its own? Or will that day ever come and they're, they're just completely integrated now? So m movies will go where there's the best tax credit. Call centers will go where there's the best well, tax it's credit. It's good business. And in, millions and millions and millions of dollars. Yeah. You so know, they're, they're, there's tons of folks that, that have raised their kids and, um, you know, contributed to the community and yeah. their community, yeah. you know, by working in that industry, you know, they're they're all paying bills. And yeah, so it keeps things flowing. That yeah, way. yeah. Uh, it, it's it, there is a fine line for sure. I know uh, when New Brunswick came out with the New Brunswick Sound Initiative a number of years back, yeah. when I was playing in the Hot Toddy Trio group mm -hmm. based out of Fredericton. You know, it, it's, it, you know, the funding that we received from that particular program springboarded us into another level or up to another level. Uh, it just allowed us to, to do the projects and record CDs and help us tour. And as a result, you know, it, it worked out yeah. really well. I think t to give artists the opportunity to, to create and establish themselves and then let them go, you know, let them do yeah, what it is that they're going to do. Yeah, yeah good point. Because maybe... Otherwise you'd never get the opportunity. Yeah, yeah cause it, is that because we don't live in a highly populated area, not a big enough market, even with the world of internet or the Justin Bieber's coming out of nowhere 10 years ago? That I think I, you ha you, in the industry that I'm in, you have to tour. Hmm. Even, even though you can do shows online and you can sell your music everywhere mm -hmm. online, you still have to travel. Mm -hmm. Canada's a big country. <laughs> you know, it's spread out. You think? Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, I'm, I'm not quite sure. I think if you lived maybe in Boston, I, I, I've heard this stat where there's more places to play uh, in Boston and an hour outside of Boston than... All of Canada? Yeah, right. Like 300 and 400 venues in Canada right. and right. three or 400 be within 60 mile right. radius of Boston. Right. Yeah. So it's a little different that way. Yeah. Mm. But you make an interesting um, slide to um, have to play, have to tour in front of people. Mm -hmm. um, something special goes on when performing for people live. Oh, absolutely. That's kind of where it's at yeah. for me. It, it's a, I want to explore in, it's a little bit like um, in sport when you get to be in the locker room or you get to be in the huddle and here it goes. Can you walk us through a little bit what it's like for you when you perform in front of people? Because they would get that sense of uh, from your perspective, rather than always seeing Tom up on stage doing his thing and looking like he's in pain when he's sliding up and down <laughs> on his guitar, right? <laughs> so, but for you, the, the prep and then to feel, is it three minutes in when you start to feel the audience's energy coming back to you? Um, is it right away when you, when you know, oh, we got this kind of house tonight? Uh, They're all different, yeah. you know? It's a, uh, but I, I think it's an accumulative thing, you know, like I started playing music when I was just little. So, I mean, it's all that, all those years kind of culminating into where I am now. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm nervous before every show. I think that's a good thing, you yeah. know, because I, I don't want to become too complacent. Yeah. 
But I mean, most of the shows that I do are, are uh, theater shows and uh, venues that I can communicate with people, make people feel something or think about something. That's kind of my job, I feel. Okay. And um, uh, it's, when I get out there, it doesn't take long before I relax and just do my thing. And, and I guess the way that I've done it is it, it's been pretty personal, you know? Yeah. It's just the way that I see life through my eyes. Yeah. And it, it's no different. You know, most everybody can relate to the things that I'm talking about because everybody's experienced them. Yeah. Yep. You know? So, uh... It doesn't feel too, uh, not naked, but uh, exposed or something because that's the art of it. Right. Well, y yeah, <laughs> kind of. <laughs> but I've never really thought, I've only had kind of one way of doing it. Hmm. And that's just to be natural and chilled and just be myself, you know, like I'm, I'm not anybody other than just me. Yeah. So that makes it easier. Yeah. You know, so the more more chilled I can be, the, the, the better I'm feeling. Yeah, the authenticity just comes through. Yeah. Fun. That's kind of the, the where it's <laughs> at for me. Yeah, but there's a certain willingness to go there that that takes. So, I mean, I'm sure the audience could easily picture, because there's musicians out there, that will have their moments in their basement, in their garages, in, right. in their in their private spaces when they're letting it rip and yep. just and out it comes. And you that's know? great too. And, yes, that's great too. Uh, but and then to throw that on stage, right? Is, wow. <laughs> I think it has something to do with personality too. You know, like it's just a natural thing for me to do. I, I love people, yeah. and I enjoy speaking with you know and meeting people all the time, and it's a real natural thing for me to just kind of. Blah. You know, I just <laughs> open up and share whatever and talk about whatever. Yeah. Some people aren't built that way. Yeah. And as a result, they're not doing what I'm doing. But some of the some really great writers never play in front of anybody. Some really great musicians never get out of the basement. Yeah. You know, they're they're much more talented than me. You know, yeah. it's just personality based. Like you're either you're either going to be okay with it or you're not, or you're going to force a, a round peg into a square hole or whatever. You know, like some some of the artists that I've met, it's painful. Yeah, yeah, you feel it. Yeah, like I remember, like I won't say, I won't say any names, but I was doing this show, a big theater theater gig, and uh, with two other guys, two other artists, well known artists. Mm -hmm. And one was asleep on the couch before the show, you know, just completely relaxed. <laughs> the other was, you know, going to the bathroom, back to the green room, to the bathroom, back to the green room, uh -huh. you know. These are seasoned, seasoned performers. Yeah. And they're going to be putting themselves out there. Yeah, sometimes, you know. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's interesting, interesting to well, well, see in that same different spirit. personalities. Yeah, and in that same spirit or same theme, when you write something new and then you decide it's time to share it because you've played with it enough or crafted it enough. Right. It's, um, do you have a, someone you go to or do you have a group that you go to to say, hey, I've just come up with this, you know, and I think I got something here, and, and then they give you that feedback? Because mm -hmm. that's a wonderfully vulnerable but powerful creative moment, too. It's a, uh, uh, most of the time uh, I'm just on my own. Yeah. And um, I, I write the stuff and then I'll pine over it for a while and I'll work it and work it and work it until finally I think it's where it should be. And, and then Wendy, my wife, is like my, you know, go-to. Yeah. And, and I'll play it for her and she'll either go, you know, uh, most times she'll say, that sounds great, but <laughs> maybe, you know, maybe you could change that line so that you're, you're communicating a little more effectively you know, by changing that word or whatever, and she she does that with me. That's great. And uh, I enjoy, I really enjoy that process because it's just another another angle that yeah. I, that I'm not thinking of. Yeah. And then the collaborations are totally different too. You know, because yeah. I've written with other artists, and sometimes you're really busy in the process, and other times you you're sitting back watching it take place. Yeah. So it's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. 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 It, both of those questions were kind of leading towards that um, public intimacy, almost, because you're willing to go into those, sometimes it's shadow spaces or darker spaces, other times you've found the joy in something and wanted to share Yeah, absolutely. It. But how fascinating when people come up to you afterward and, and share with you their experience of your material. Yeah, how, how it's affected them and how they go to a certain place when they hear something, hmm. you know, a memory or... 
Do you have any good anecdotes about people coming up and say, say how you, you resonated with them somehow? Somewhere? You know, like it, it happens quite a bit. Yeah. And um, you know, some of the songs, like there's a song on the Blue Sky Day album called Stand Tall. Yes. You know, and it's just, uh, everybody's felt that fragility of being unsure and, uh, go, you know, living through troubled times, whatever it happens to be that you're going through. Yeah. Uh, but I, I've had people come up and just say, that really helped me, you know, that helped me get through this particular time in my life, you know. Um, that's rewarding. Mm, you know, mm. I'm, I don't set out to do that. I'm just it's, no. It's it's just what follows the energy. Yeah. Because when you throw that energy out there, it's going to resonate right. with some people somehow. Right. Right. I, and We're not far removed from one another. No. With our experiences in life. Yeah. And you find that through music that um, you might be working on a higher connection level than some people, or that it invites you into that higher connection space. So. What I'm thinking is when you're writing a song, so you're in the creative process, you're in the beginning of it, something in you is humming and it wants to come out. Right. But at the same time, are you also conscious to a degree of, the, not as a target audience thing, not doing the marketing thing, I'm thinking more of the spiritual thing, that you, this is going to touch some people because it's touching you so deeply? Sometimes I think it's bigger than you can actually, <laughs> you know, yeah. put into words. Yeah. It's bigger than us. You yeah. Know? Uh, for example, there's a, uh, an instrumental tune that I wrote for my wife and her mom and dad who live down in, uh, along the Sunrise Trail in, in a little place called Seafoam. Mm -hmm. you know? they, their place overlooks Northumberland Strait. It's just beautiful there. But this, the, the, I wanted to write a song for them and I was thinking of a lyrical piece of music and, and I, nothing was coming to me. So it just ended up as an instrumental. But it was a genre of music that it, that just I didn't know anything about, you know, and uh, it just fell out of me. It just fell out of me. I didn't even know where it came from, and it baffled me. Where did that come from, you know? Yeah. And um, <laughs> so this is a story. So it's take a couple minutes, but it's good. Um, it's kind of a Celtic flavored thing, you know. Um, Anyway, my brother calls me, and I'm, I was on tour somewhere. Michael called me, and he said, I just found out where our great-great-great-grandparents are buried. Whoa. And I said, uh, really? And he said, yeah, it's about, you know, 25 minutes from my house in Sussex. So he said, on your way home, why don't you just stop in, and I'll take you out there, and you can check it out. It's... So we, I stopped in, and I jumped in the car, and we, we headed out uh, towards uh, Funday National Park. And he pulled the car off to the side of the road, and I said, Michael, I've been here before. And he, he, uh, he said, really? I said, yeah, you stop in here. Like, um, I actually stopped, because I, I had to relieve myself. <laughs> and uh, I noticed it's a little graveyard, and so I went through the woods a little bit, and sure enough, it was the most peaceful, beautiful little place. And from that point on, I would always stop there. If it was a beautiful, sunny day, I would stop, and I'd go lay in the grass there. You know, just kind of, uh, just to chill out for a few minutes, you know, and just uh, because I was always going or coming from somewhere, and yeah, and yeah. this little spot became my little refuge, you know, where I just chilled out. Some people may may think I'm <laughs> out of my mind, but you know, um, I was unaware that my great 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 grandparents were on, were buried only just a few feet from where I was laying. You know, for a number of years I was going in there, and there they were, laying there, you know. So they came from Sligo, Ireland, and um, they, they got a chunk of land in a, a place called Swift's Mountain in that area. And this is all, all you know, I find this out afterwards. Um, and then it struck me, you know, that's where that, that's where that song came from, because I, a guy wanted to to uh, wanted me to go to Ireland to do a tour and, and I was telling him that story and he said well what part of Ireland are you from and I said well the northern part like up the Sligo area and he goes oh they're known for their poetry and music so one of the last times I popped in there I just grabbed my guitar I went over and played the tune on their gravesite for them yeah. yeah and it all made sense yeah so that's an example of something being <laughs> way bigger than we can get our heads wrapped around yeah it, yes 
and so. it starts with you listening to something other than how we normally listen or you have a yeah. different level of awareness going on or me just being this present yeah me just being there and being i guess oh, uh, I, I it didn't have anything to do with me being open minded or anything no, no, it just it, happened you it know? comes from somewhere it else just happened yeah so i can't you can't really explain things like that there's a lovely book by uh, Paulo Coelho called Aleph, mm -hmm. um, and he talks about spaces where um, you transcend where you are in that moment and something else is happening if you can tune your vibration or awareness into it. Right. In his novel, um, based on real life experience actually, it was one of his first ones that was closer to autobiographical. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, regressing to past lives for those that are willing and want to go there. Right. Because there was something unresolved from three or four hundred years before. I mean, come on, it's bigger than it's fascinating what we're aware of. If, yeah. if we're willing to open up to well, that, absolutely. how much we're all connected, or Richard Bach's stuff on uh, parallel universes all at the same time. And there may be many things like that that happen in a person's life. Yeah. But we're, we're so busy and we're so maybe disconnected uh, because of this, that, or the other thing, we're so busy. Life is so busy, and we're moving so fast now yeah. that maybe we just don't recognize them. You know? Yeah, and that's but I'm, where I'm, I'm, I'm a firm believer, and everybody experiences that. Yeah, and and there's the power of music or vibration through music. There's this lovely clip by Dr. Sue Mortar, um, teaching how the heart's um, power is, you know, 50 times greater than the brain's for mm -hmm. sensing uh, environment around you. And she'll do the guitar analogy, say if there's a guitar in this corner of the room and a guitar in that corner of the room and they're in tune with each other, you pluck the D string on this guitar, that guitar is going to vibrate. Right. The heart is an instrument the that same. can be tuned. Right. Your music is a way of transcending all the gaps and differences to let people find their right. resonance with each other. My wife is into yoga and meditation and whatnot. Too, she got so you I'm doing really yoga yet? Not yet. <laughs> Not yet. Sorry, I, I, but interrupt. believe me, I, I I really should be, but I I haven't uh, embraced it yet. Yeah. Sorry, but I interrupt to keep going. So no, no, no. But meditation. I mean, that's one way of getting there too. You know, just hearing your own heartbeat, and we try to get the kids out of the city as often as we can yeah. to just allow that to take place. Yeah. You know, you'd, you'd be an interesting cat to be doing home with. You know, home. Yeah. Well, I mean, hold that note. Yeah. <laughs> I try to do that. Hold that note. You know. <laughs> Oh, fun. <clears throat> to explore further the, slide back away maybe from the metaphysical, unexplicable stuff into um, what's it like for you now touring Atlanta, Canada or the music scene in Atlanta, Canada? Um, l lots of buzz, lots more little venues popping up. I shouldn't say little because they're all pretty significant in their yep. own right. You yep. know? Well, absolutely. Little isn't always measured by uh, um, attendance. Greatness rates, you know? or anything. No. Yeah. Because there's, there's Paddle Fest, there's Harvest in Frederick, and of course St. John I think has got something humming again. Yeah, um, something. I was just talking to Brent Mason today uh, yeah. about that. And there's there's, there's a new Lar festival. Larley there. Creek. There's the, the one in um, Gagetown. And that's yeah. just little New Brunswick. Yeah. Know? But I think there's some 16 odd festivals of some sort through the summer. Yeah, there's a new festival, the Neely Festival, just outside Sussex, and uh, that's an interesting little festival. Okay. There's t tons of places, and the Atlanta Canada has been really kind to me. Yeah. I, you know, I've basically made my living, you know, since my son was born, you know, I, I didn't want to be on the road all the time, and thus I have found some work in the studio producing music, and okay. things that allow me to be home. Um, but Atlanta Canada has been really great for me. There's there's a lot of places to play, uh, you know, everything from beautiful theaters to little house concerts. Yeah. You know, and I, I love them all. Like a, any place where I can play is great. Yeah. But there's a certain charm in, in all of them. Yeah. They yeah. all have their uniqueness, you know. Um, mainstream media will often have a narrative about New Brunswick struggling to be successful. Um, they'll think IT world, they'll think of government policy and, and getting in the way of things. Right. Everyone wanting um, wanting success, but they all have their own definition of it. Right. Um, back to the spirit of laying by your great-great-grandparents' graveyard and being still, mm -hmm. sometimes um, it would be interesting if New Brunswick just took a pause right. and saw all of the good things that they're already right. doing. Right. And for me, music and uh, what you do and what a lot of other people do is part of that. 
Yeah, There's yeah. something transformative happening in this little province right mm -hmm. now, and yeah. music is kind of leading the way in a way. Well, it, it'll it'll be a, it'll be one thing out of many things that that should be respected, I believe. Yeah, another one is kind of farming. Yeah. And, you know, the pleasure of doing the show for three years now. Several guests have been on, and it's fascinating to see how often food and farming and self-sufficiency will wheedle its way into a discussion about provincial economy or right, right. Um, autonomy, those sorts of things. Well, it's about our lifestyle here, and we want to, you know, if you, you can find something that's a positive, and, and you can support your family or support a community. Yeah. I know uh, Keith Mullins is a, uh, another artist, a guy from Cape Breton, who uh, he and his wife have, have a little farm where they and they, they, we were one of the drop-off points for, for food drop-off. So they drop off like 35 bags of, of vegetables uh, once a week. And people would come to our place to pick their bag up. You know, I mean, like, yeah. they were feeding families out of that one little farm. Yep. The, I mean, how wonderful is that? Isn't that powerful? Yeah. Yeah. Like this stuff wasn't <laughs> coming from the States. It was being grown only just a few miles organically yeah. from their community. You know? New Brunswick imports roughly 90%, 92% of its food. Right. And yet one of our struggling economies is farming. Right. Is it, there's a disconnect there that's there's quite a real stunning. Oh, yeah. And I mean, uh, the poor farmers. <laughs> they make it so difficult for them yep. to yep. do what it is that they're doing. And you would see a lot of that as you travel because you've, you have a unique perspective on the province from not yeah. only being on stage, but the constant movement. Oh, absolutely. I see it. There's a lot of uh, aspects of uh, the province that I've had insight to. Um, I, you know, I love this province. Mm. And um, I, th I think uh, it's ever-changing. Yeah. You know, some, some things you got to pound your fist on the table to... Uh, to try to make some change, and, and uh, but overall, I think, I think, uh, you know, I think with this liberal government, I haven't really seen what it, too much about what they're doing because I'm in, uh, in, yeah, I've been dealing with that other liberal government, kinda, <laughs> and then I was talking to me, Amelia Curran, is another great singer-songwriter, Juno Award-winning artist. I was talking to her this morning over coffee, and she's going back home to you know, to fight some of their policies that they're putting into place to close libraries and this, that, and the other thing in, in Newfoundland. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, you know, it's good to be involved yeah. and be aware of what's happening. Yeah. Left, you were talking about uh, some of the interaction between artists and political change and happiness with the area that you live in mm -hmm. because you guys have a unique experience of community. Right. And, uh, and also you communicate in a way that's very different from trying to win like a politician might want to win their point or an industrialist might want to win their point so right. they can get the policy change. You're more in the gaps where all the pieces come together. Do you see um, on your horizons or from your perspective where there's um, a shift is going to occur? Uh, what I'm thinking of is a lot of stuff has changed since 2012. Um, mm -hmm. You can tell systems are breaking down. Mm -hmm. um, something new needs to be created. And in that lovely chaos of the unknown, of what's mm -hmm. coming for the next 20 years, artists tend to show us the way. Right. Do you have any sense of that um, from your tribe that you run with or from your own work and then feedback back from people that you're speaking to a happier, more connected place and that's the way we need to go? Yeah, I, I, I don't know. Um, you know, we're all affected by our age, too. <laughs> you know what I mean? And um, yeah. I think, you know, like, like we spoke of small farming, you know, small small farms that are um, like Keith, yeah. Keith's farm, Keith and Jody's farm, you know, where they're feeding so many families. And uh, I love that whole concept. And uh, um, for me, I just have my own personal little thing, you know, the way that I'm going about things, and my deal is not, I'm not looking too big. Yeah. I'm looking, I, I like to kind of keep it smaller. Yep. So that, you know, I can do what it is that I lo love to do, 
but at the same time I can be there for my kids and I can be there as a family guy yeah. and um, you know um, have, a, have a life that's a little you know I, I'm not looking huge and I find like that's what's happening maybe a little bit to answer your question in a kind of yeah. weird way I think there's a lot of people that are, yeah. are done with with big infrastructures and government jobs and all this you know the way that it was at one time I think it's smaller now I think people are uh, even though it's crazy with the information technology and we're still getting our heads wrapped around all this information that comes in to us we're starting to understand maybe some of us are starting to get a grip on how we handle it and how much we're gonna take mm -hmm. Because there was a while there where you're just overwhelmed yeah. by everything. Do you have a sense following that theme that it might get to, uh, we come full circle and it'll just come back to human, basic old human relationships yeah. and having your good day? Yeah, well, well, we're trying to find some balance there yeah. between, you know, as a boy growing up in Macadam, my mom saying to me, you know, come home when you're hungry or when the street lights come on. Yeah. You know, see you later. Yeah. That was a beautiful way to grow up. Now to this micromanaging everything, and we're just trying to find a balance in there, yeah. you know. Yeah. But I think it all, you know, if you start looking too big, you lose something at home. So uh, for me, just keeping it small and making it work for me. Yeah. And a lot of people are doing that; they're making it work for themselves. When I was home raising my twin boys when they were born, um, and they got to be you know, four, five, or six, and start to be integrated more into the school systems and that daily schedule you just mm -hmm. described, um, our great pleasure was pajama days. Yeah. There's no structure to the day. Right. And Dad, can we have a pajama day? I said, right. yeah, a whole weekend. You know? right. and, and amazing the human difference in when they wanted to eat right. and what they could create in the course of a day, and to follow it through until it naturally ended. Absolutely. Instead of now we need to stop because it's this time we got to go do this yeah, now. Totally. All those transitions. Um, sp if you're willing, speak to being a dad. You know, that's it's an awesome thing. Oh my God! <clears throat> yeah. You know, do you? It's what's what's one of your most fun things to do as a dad? Just be with them. Mm. You know, like uh, I'm not always successful at it, but just to just come down enough to just be with them. Mm. Not an activity, you know, although we're inundated with ton, you know, just a ton of stuff going on. <laughs> just being. Well, with raising my boys, um, most of the literature and the common knowledge, or acceptance of the common knowledge, is that zero to five is really important. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but something's been missing for men in general, in society, in society's narrative. I mean, it's not been an easy 50 years for right, men. Right. Um, so in raising boys, I, I really feel that that 12 to 18 window is more powerful than the zero to five. Yeah. But there's a gap there um, to help them through, you know, an older male giving them the safe space that they can go and explore in and make their mistakes, but still be okay, right. the mentoring or the, the older, the elder kind of thing. Mm -hmm. to, mm -hmm. even, even for 35 to 50 year olds, there's right. a gap there as men make mistakes or go want to go explore or, right. or express themselves. You know, there's a certain courage you have with expressing yourself the way you do through your medium. Right. Um, that, that comes with a certain internal peace to be able to kind of do that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of men from early age on that didn't have that nurturing space that allowed them to go, that's what this feels like. Right. And, and not be judged for it, or right. actually be praised for it, or held, you know, hugged for it. Right. Well, I mean, growing up, you know, my dad was on the road all the time, and mom did a lot of the, did everything. Yeah. So there, there maybe there, there was a, there, there was a big bit of a gap there. Sure, well, we sure. all have, we're that generation, yeah, yeah. you know? And so we've had to fill it and kind of, of that, on our own. Yeah, and, and that kind of, you know, tough approach to mm. just being a man. Yeah, but, um, but that doesn't uh, resonate, does no, it? No, uh, that's what's really changed as far as uh, the way that I am raising my son. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm there and uh, hopefully, uh, you know, trying to get his broad a perspective and all-encompassing kind of view of everything for him yeah and nothing really is wrong 
Yeah. Everything is good, whatever you're feeling, you know, like just let's talk about it or it's okay if you want a hug, yeah. you know, or you, you, you're crying, it's okay. Yeah, yeah you gotta you get know. that out. Yeah, um, I don't think we necessarily had that opportunity as kids. No. You know, it was always like you, you just stop that. So yeah. You don't do that. Yeah, you don't do that or uh, be quiet. Right. You know, a um, right. good child is uh, you don't hear you, you don't see you. Right. <laughs> right. No, no, absolutely. How, how do you go explore and find, you know, who you are, your authentic self right. in that kind right. of condition? And it's just different eras. Some it of is it. a different era. And, and there's been some, you know, the larger social narrative um, past 50 years has been dominated. The feminist agenda has, has really taken root and manifest mm -hmm. on a lot of policies. Mm -hmm. Notice it through the elementary school system and right. stuff. So it's really hard to try to recover the sacred male Mm -hmm. um, in the spirit of that context because th there hasn't been any narrative about right, it. Right. Even though it all still exists, we mm -hmm. just haven't promoted it much. So. Right. Well, I, I mean, um, I don't think, you know, for the most part, I don't think anybody knows what the hell they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's a sign of getting older again. Yeah, but I mean, <laughs> one of the things that is steadfast is, uh, is, is uh, the consistency of being there for your kid. Mm. And I, I think kindness uh, with your child goes a long way. Yeah. You know, so there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's what I kind of f try to focus on yeah. as much as I can. Uh, just to be there and, and, and to reassure them that everything's okay. Has any of that wheedle its way into your music yet? Uh, yeah. I would say, yeah, there's... My kids are always in my music. They're always with you, right? Because uh, it gives you a perspective or when you hear them, something will hit inside yeah, of you. Yeah, I'm and an emotional guy. You know, like I feel things and as the world comes in through my eyes and ears. And, and then we talked about earlier on the show, it comes through spiritually to you when you don't even know what's happening. And uh, I'm pretty in tune with that. And um, so I carry you know, I guess you want to say love or whatever. I carry love in my heart, and, and they're, they're, they're love in my heart for sure. So they're with me all the time. Yeah. yeah. So we have about mm, 10 minutes or so left. Um, yeah. Let's talk about your new CD. Yeah. Let's go get into that stuff. And just so the audience knows, we're recording this on the Victoria Day weekend in 2016. The uh, show will be on air for a while. Um, but this is time sensitive, but Mr. Swift has this lovely new CD out. And it'll probably show up fine. Does it look like him? Yeah, it kind of looks like yeah, him. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So you want to speak to your... No place to hide with that cover shot. No, the legend of Roy Black. Actually, we'll probably see you on next season's Game of Thrones. That, that, <laughs> that, that might be what happens for those Well, my see. wife said, uh, one of her friends said I looked like a Viking or something <laughs> on the front of it. But uh, it was just me. Yeah, it's just you. Yeah. So this new CD, it's uh, music, it's heart. Yeah, it's a little bit of uh, departure from my other CDs and that I kind of uh, went back to my roots, I think, with this CD. I started playing music when I was just young and it was all acoustic music, you know, house party stuff and whatnot. And yep. a lot of my CDs uh, have had drums and electric guitars and I just went back to acoustic instruments and. Um, Tom Easley, who I played in Hot Toddy Trio with, is a wonderful upright bass player. Just a, uh, he uh, he and I just kind of build the foundation of built the foundation of the album together. You know, over a couple of weeks. You know, once I had it all written, and then uh, this young guy Ace Abrocious, uh, he lived in uh, the States for a while. He's living in Halifax now. Um, he's a pedal steel player, and I heard him play, and he moved me. And, Mm -hmm. in a really lovely way, uh, just a master player. He, he came in and, and did some work on it. And uh, my brother in arms, uh, the master, you know, J.P. Cormier, he came, yeah. you know, I asked him if he would be so kind to play on it and he jumped and... Uh, Very cool. So he played on it. Gunning mixed and mastered it. Uh, Dave Gunning at his studio. Mm -hmm. Charles Austin has been a guy in the music scene in Nova Scotia, kind of a guru. Producer, engineer, artist. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Lanwa type. Yep. Yeah, you know, an extremely smart guy and well respected man and very kind. And he and I are very close. 
um, I just went to his studio to track it all, and uh, so it was painless. Really, it was great. <laughs> but it's it's a fun CD. I'm I'm really happy with it. Do you have? Um, can you teach our audience about some of those tracks? One or two of them that you want to tell a story about how it came to be or something? That yeah. Um, you know, yeah. there there's a tune that the CD starts out with "Well Worn Road." It's called. I think of New Brunswick roads. You're gonna talk about your maritime roads. Yeah, just roads <laughs> everywhere. Yeah, you know, and I kind of consider myself a pretty well-worn road after all these years, <laughs> and um, and uh, other people will relate to it. Anybody that does any traveling, um, there's a tune on there called "House," a tune that I wrote thinking of my mom and dad. My my mom's in a seniors home with Alzheimer's mm. and um, when she went in there I kind of left my dad uh, at home by himself yeah and they've been married over 60 years and um, that's a hard thing to watch you know like this whole aging process you know with your parents and um, to see them work so hard for so many years to, to provide uh, us the community yeah. You know, with everything they had, just full bore, steam, full steam ahead. They were involved in a lot of, a lot of things in Macadam. Um, it was, it's been a really hard thing for our family to deal with this Alzheimer's thing with her mom, and then to watch our dad be by, by himself. Yeah. So the, that tune. I'm struggling trying to find something positive, you know, like just because we were. Well, it, it, it's sad, it's okay. Yeah, you know, it's but but the, I think I what I found mm -hmm. was that you know I took uh, um, comfort in knowing that it all uh, you know everything that they've done it, it, it is ending, but then it all begins again with me, yeah. and then it'll end with me, and it'll all begin again with my kids. So I mean that's what it's all about. Yep, and it's one of those conversations we don't have enough right. of, you know, the cycle. Right. And the responsibility that goes with the cycle right. and the joy that goes with the cycle. Right, um, right. It's one thing to just say, well, that's life, you know, but, uh, no. I mean, <laughs> uh, I think the positive thing is that it all does begin again. And uh, yeah. so that tune, there's, there's, there's some stuff on there that was influenced by a trip to Nashville that I had not long ago. Uh, kind of an old style um, Marty Robbins kind of feel <laughs> to it, you know. And uh, there's another one. I have three buddies of mine that lost their wives oh in my. the past year, you know, to cancer. And it was my perspective. Certainly didn't know what they were going through, but it was my perspective as I spoke to them and and hung out with them. Yeah. You know, that's kind of it's called broken glass, and so it's it's still it's all of. Per, very kind of personal stuff. Yeah, but it's, that's true artist work, though. Well, yeah. It really is. Yeah. You go into those spaces and you give it a shape and a tone and let us all feel it with you. Yeah. Well, I mean, everybody uh, if in my demographic, I guess, you know, we're all dealing with aging parents, you know. Yeah. Some go quick, some live into their 90s in homes, and some live by themselves, and, and you know, it's just a. It's a very difficult time. Yep. You know. And it, that's, um, that's one of those narratives. I uh, had a lovely chance to interview one time Monty Peters out of Fredericton, um, Catholic priest. Yep, Monty, uh, I know. He's an institution, you yeah, know, he's a great around guy. there. And, and it was about how we don't have integrated enough in daily life, that narrative of the full cycle. Right. Um, um, about dealing with uh, the end of life in, in a compassionate and not an objectified way that it's over there. Right. It is. And another interview <coughs> I had was with um, Bill Randall and mm -hmm. uh, Barb Burnett, um, Ger gerontology, no, prof of Bill gerontology, too. you know, <coughs> and Barb at the Atlantic <coughs> Aging Great Institute yep. and, and integrating those conversations in. Um, this goes back to how artists guide us through things, right? right? Well, because you can do the academic version or the analytical version, but there's the other version right. that you've captured in. Your well, city. I try to. I, I just it's my perspective, and I just and as I said early in the program, you know, we all go th through very similar things. Yeah. We have about a minute left. How yeah. do you want to end this wonderful conversation? Well, I just uh, want to say thanks to you hmm. for having me on. I mean, we've known each other for a lot. Of, 
a lot of years, and it's been a long time coming. And I apologize for I know. for uh, not being able to make it happen earlier, but I'm really happy that it, yeah, that we were fit. able to do it in the end. It was meant to be today. Yeah, man. It was just cool. But yeah, it was a total pleasure and good. Yeah, we'll, well, we'll do it again sometime. Thanks for sharing with you. Thanks. And as we sign off, I'm going to try to steal one of Tom's lines. See if I can do it. It's um, something like um, "Blue skies above you, um, someone to love you." That ain't so bad. Right. Great. So as always, thank you for watching the Dennis Report, and you'll find us on YouTube and on the DennisAtchison.com website. Be good, have fun, and love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.